Throughout 1916, the big guns roared, but by the end of the year, the stalemate on all fronts of the First World War had not been broken. Troops still crouched in the trenches, and hundreds of thousands of lives had been lost in futile attempts like the Battle of the Somme to break through against machine guns and barbed wire. As 1917 began, Tsar Nicholas II of Russia reviewed his army on the Western Front. Despite the ceremonial, it was an army in deep crisis. More than two years of defeats at the hands of the Germans and Austro-Hungarians had brought it to the brink of mutiny. Almost two million men had died, apparently uselessly. Then in March 1917, the home front collapsed. A strike at the Putilov factory in Petrograd turned into widespread rioting. Army units joined the rioters in demanding a change of government. And within two weeks, representatives of Russia's National Assembly, the Duma, had persuaded the Tsar to abdicate. Under heavy guard, Nicholas Romanov was taken to his former summer residence at Tsatskoye Tselo. For more than a year, he and his family were kept prisoner at a variety of locations. Conditions were often relaxed, and they were allowed a considerable degree of freedom. Two of the princesses even posed with their captors with their heads shaved after an attack of measles. But then, in July 1918, at this house in Ekaterinburg, the imperial family was suddenly slaughtered in this room. The new Soviet government had decided that they were too dangerous to be left alive. Local rumor insisted that the bodies were dismembered, burned, destroyed with acid, and the remains dumped in this disused mine shaft. When white Russian troops found remnants of the family's belongings there in 1919, it was assumed that the rumor was true. For the next 70 years, it was thought that all trace of Russia's last imperial family had disappeared near Ekaterinburg. Their bodies were never found and the world was left with the mystery of how they could have disappeared so swiftly and completely. Their power had been absolute for more than two centuries, and their sudden disappearance seemed all the more shocking and extraordinary. The rise of the empire over which Nicholas ruled had begun under Peter the Great in the 17th century. From his great capital at St. Petersburg, the Tsars ruled by 1900 an empire which stretched from Europe to the Pacific. It took in modern Poland, Finland, and the Baltic states, as well as today's new Central Asian states. Nicholas II had come to the imperial throne in 1894, and this unique film shows his wedding procession, which followed a few weeks after his coronation. He was one of a tight-knit group of interrelated families which ruled the major European powers. His grandmother was Britain's Queen Victoria. One of his cousins was Wilhelm, Kaiser of a newly unified German Empire. They met frequently, but Nicholas did not like his ambitious and aggressive cousin. Nicholas's uncle was the Prince of Wales, Britain's future Edward VII. The empire to which Nicholas had succeeded was an absolute state in which all power was held by one man, the Tsar. There was no council or parliament to give him advice, and every minister was his personal servant. The autocracy of the Tsars was strongly upheld by the Russian Orthodox Church, which was controlled by a government department. 
and much of the land and wealth were in the hands of a small aristocracy, which did little to justify its privileges. Russia was still a rural society, little affected by the industrial revolution which had transformed Britain, Germany and America. The peasants had only been released from serfdom in 1861. They owned little land, conditions were backward, and there was widespread poverty and hunger as the population grew rapidly. Many peasants became heavily indebted to their landlords, and every few years their misery led to risings against a class which seemed to contribute nothing to its country. Nicholas's grandfather had allowed the establishment of village councils, and some of these had attempted to bring education and other improvements to the life of the peasantry. But most education remained under the control of the church, which battled hard against the spread of liberal ideas. But there were changes affecting this backward society. Population growth had meant that the cities were expanding rapidly. A new middle class of merchants was growing and industries were being developed. Educated Russians were beginning to demand greater freedom. Nicholas II was a pleasant and charming man married to a strong-willed half-German princess, Alexandra. She bore him four beautiful daughters, Maria, Olga, Tatiana and Anastasia. And then in 1905, a son, Alexander. Tragically, it was soon discovered that the boy had haemophilia and he often had to be carried by a special guardian to prevent him injuring himself. They formed a charming and devoted family, although the Tsarina began increasingly to show signs of nervous tension, which often confined her to a wheelchair. This film shows the imperial princesses at play with members of the court. They lived a charmed but unreal existence, which cut them off from all but the most restricted view of the country over which their father ruled. Only rarely did the Tsar have any contact with ordinary people, and he knew little of their problems. Even when they went on holiday on the royal yacht Standart, ceremony and crowds of courtiers followed the imperial family. The yacht did represent the nearest thing to a private home that Nicholas and his family possessed, and some of the photographs taken during their holidays show a charming informality. But in reality, Tsar Nicholas II completely failed to understand the rapidly growing problems of the empire which he had inherited. His father, Alexander III, had led a reaction against liberal reforms such as freeing the serfs. Nicholas inherited a massive secret police apparatus as well as the largest army in the world. Like so much in Russia, it looked impressive on the surface, but was ill-equipped and out of date. Nicholas kept his father's widely feared interior minister, Pobodonostsev, and gave him a free hand in crushing any opposition. The Tsar could not imagine any other form of government than his own absolute autocracy. 
when Pobodonostsev was assassinated, the Tsar replaced him with Plevo, a man described as the symbol of autocracy gone mad. It was Plevo who persuaded the Tsar in 1904 to try to divert popular unrest by provoking a war with Japan. The army, for all its show, proved hopelessly outclassed, and when the Imperial Navy sailed halfway around the world to attack the Japanese, it was smashed by them at the Battle of Tsushima. News of this terrible defeat seemed to open the floodgates of popular unrest. The workers of St. Petersburg and Moscow held protest meetings and strikes, and on Bloody Sunday, the 22nd of January, 1905, Several hundred people were shot down in the center of St. Petersburg. Units of the Black Sea fleet mutinied, but eventually order was restored when the Tsar agreed to allow a Duma, or elected parliament. But his chief minister, Stolypin, persuaded him to break his promise to share power even before the Duma met. Among the revolutionary leaders involved in the 1905 revolt was Vladimir Ilyich Lenin leader of the Bolshevik faction of the Marxist Social Democratic Party. Lenin had been convinced that the Tsar would not allow the Duma any power, and when this proved correct, he fled abroad to continue his work of crushing any attempts to build up a truly democratic opposition to Tsarist autocracy and preparing for a workers' revolt, which could put a people's autocracy in power in the Kremlin. The Tsar went back to reliance on his old allies, altering power within the Duma to give more control to the landowners. But the Tsar's divorce from reality was made worse by the arrival at court of an illiterate holy man, Rasputin. He was a drunkard with a scandalous sex life, but the Tsarina became convinced that he could help control Alexander's haemophilia and he was soon her most trusted advisor and closely involved with the family. By 1914, rivalry between two great military alliances in Europe, Germany and Austro-Hungary on the one side, and France, Britain and Russia on the other, had brought the continent to a high state of tension. It seemed that any spark could lead to confrontation. And on the 28th of June, it came, as the Austro-Hungarian Archduke Franz Ferdinand visited Sarajevo, capital of Bosnia. Bombs had been thrown as he and his wife drove to the town hall, but they were not injured. Then, as they left it, shots rang out. The Archduke and his wife were mortally wounded. Responsibility for the outrage was pinned on Serbian nationalists opposed to Austro-Hungarian rule over part of the Balkans. Austro-Hungary used this outrage to threaten Serbia. Russia mobilized to defend its ally, Germany felt obliged to do so as well, and soon the whole continent was marching to war. The first blows fell in the west, where the French army was barely able to hold a massive German attempt to knock their country out of the war in a matter of weeks. The power of modern artillery and machine guns then halted all maneuvers, and the rival armies dug into a line of trenches stretching from Switzerland to the English Channel. For Russia, the war began disastrously. Her vast army creaked into life and lumbered forward into East Prussia. There, at the Battle of the Tannenberg Lakes, it was utterly defeated, with more than 100,000 killed and many more wounded. News of the disaster and the sight of the returning wounded fueled popular discontent with the Tsar's regime. And during the next two years, this grew steadily as the ill-equipped but long-suffering troops were led to one disaster after another by a corrupt and incompetent leadership. By the end of 1916, the Tsar had taken personal control of his army, but it was exhausted, demoralized, and close to collapse. 
Disastrously, his departure to the front enabled the Tsarina to take over effective control of the government. She was distrusted because of her German background and the faith she placed in Rasputin, who seemed to dominate her completely. Finally, even the aristocracy could stand no more. At the end of 1916, four noblemen, two of them relatives of the Tsar, invited Rasputin to a party. They fed him poison, which had little effect, shot him several times, and then battered his head in before throwing his body into the Neva River. The murder of Rasputin made the Tsar more obstinate. Within a few weeks came the workers' revolts and army mutiny of March 1917. The Duma set up a provisional government, and the Tsar was forced to abdicate. Crowds cheered as the symbols of imperial power were torn down. The Tsar and his family were placed under house arrest. Lenin, who was in Switzerland when this first Russian revolution took place, made desperate efforts to return. From his writings, the Germans knew that he was utterly opposed to Russian involvement in the war. So they arranged for him to be secretly transported back via Sweden and Finland. On the 16th of April, Lenin's train pulled into the Finland station in St. Petersburg. He was greeted by crowds and immediately set to work undermining the parties which were trying to set up a democratic liberal government and ensuring that Russia pulled out of the war. His message had great appeal to the hungry and desperate people. For the new provisional government led by Alexander Kerensky had insisted on fighting on. A final military disaster in June 1917 led to the destruction of Kerensky's power. The army mutinied, he attempted to suppress it and Lenin's Bolsheviks, but by the beginning of November he had fled into exile in Paris. Lenin and his Bolshevik party seized power and set about imposing the dictatorship of the proletariat. The Bolsheviks' first action was to end the war, and by March 1918, Leon Trotsky had negotiated the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk, which ceded vast areas of the country, including the Ukraine, Poland and Finland, to the Germans. But Lenin's enemies would allow his government no peace. His new People's Red Army soon found itself opposed by white Russian supporters of the Tsar. A massive civil war broke out. Enemies threatened the new Bolshevik regime on all sides. The former allies of the Tsar sent troops. British forces landed at Murmansk and French in the Black Sea ports. The Japanese took advantage of the confusion to move into Siberia. It was against this background that the decision was made that the imperial family was too dangerous as a focus of resistance to be left alive. Tsar and Tsarina were now living at a mansion in Ekaterinburg, known ominously as the House of Special Purpose. The whole former imperial family was there with them, together with the Tsar's personal doctor and a valet and a maid. On the 14th of July, a new man was put in charge, Yakov Yorovsky, a member of the dreaded Bolshevik secret police, the Cheka. At midnight on the 16th of July, he told the family and their servants to get up, dress, and go to a small room from which all the furniture had been moved. Yorovsky's secret report then details what happened. Twelve executioners listed here were already waiting in the room. 
each had been detailed to kill a specific person. As the family entered the room, Yurovsky told them that they were to be executed, and the guards opened fire. The Tsar died in the first fusillade, but the bullets seemed to bounce off the girls, and they ran around screaming. They were finished off with bayonets, and it was discovered that they had jewellery sewn into their underclothes, which had deflected the shots. The Tsar's son was still groaning, so Yurovsky's assistant, Nikulin, shot him three more times. Later, a pathetic note in German was scribbled on the wall of the room, saying that this was where the imperial family had died. Yurovsky sent a coded message to Moscow announcing that the execution had been carried out. He then set about disposing of the bodies, having already ordered up a large consignment of acid. Peasants reported mysterious events at a disused mine north of the town. In 1919, this was officially investigated by the white Russian Nikolai Sokolov. He found clothing which had been burned and jewellery which was identified as belonging to the family. Sokolov's conclusion was that the bodies must have been destroyed by acid and burning and that this was all that remained of the family. In 1977, the House of Special Purpose was destroyed on special instructions from Moscow by Boris Yeltsin, then chief of the Communist Party in the Urals. And there, the mystery of the whereabouts of the Tsar and his family seemed to rest. But the absence of any corpses meant that not everyone was totally convinced that all the family were dead. In one of Stalin's camps, there were reports of a man claiming to be the Tsar's son. And there was a persistent attempt to claim that the youngest daughter, Anastasia, had survived. This began when Berlin police pulled a mentally disturbed girl out of a canal in 1920. For the next 64 years, Anna Anderson claimed unsuccessfully to be the rightful heir to the Tsar's assets in Germany. Then in 1989, Glasnost led to the declassifying of Executioner Yurovsky's report. This revealed that the bodies had not been left at the mine, but taken deeper into the forest. When the lorries carrying them became bogged down, a pit was hastily dug. An attempt was made to burn the bodies of Anastasia and Alexei, and they were left beside the pit. Then acid was poured over the others, and the grave filled with rubble. Finally, it was covered with railway sleepers. In July 1991, a team of archaeologists was sent from Moscow to investigate the site. The pit was as described by Yurovsky, and a mass of skulls and bones removed. These were carefully examined, and then listed and bagged so as to ensure accurate identification. Computer reconstructions were used to match the skulls with photographs of the Tsar and his family and servants. DNA samples were matched with surviving relatives of the imperial family. By the end of the investigation, there was little doubt that remains of all 11 had been found. And the investigators were even able to position most of the bodies in the grave. First was the Tsar, lying beside his doctor, Botkin. Then the three older daughters, whose skeletons were found to have bayonet marks on them, thus bearing out the rumor that they had had to be stabbed to death. Three skeletons were identified as being the servants. And finally, the Tsarina was located, lying amidst her family. Now this muddy grave in a forest track could be confirmed as the last resting place of an imperial family which had ruled Russia in such splendor and fallen so tragically. One of the great mysteries of the 20th century was at an end.